Nervous? Extremely. Why? I don't talk about it very much. In fact, this mystery woman has never talked publicly before about what happened to Desiree Sunford. How close do you and Desiree get? Extremely. Many people believe she knows all the answers and all the dark secrets. What did he actually confess to? He told me eventually everything. But I'm beginning to wonder if she'll ever tell the truth. There was a lot of anger. You can stop the tears. You know, I don't buy a word you're saying. No one wants to know what happened to Desiree Sunford more than her mom, Connie. My heart will never be whole again. This, no doubt, has taken a huge emotional and physical toll on you. My health has been greatly declining, and now I'm stuck with oxygen, heart failure, to go along with my mental anguish. Thank you for the courage to tell Desiree's story. That's the only thing I can do for her now, is to make sure that everyone hears her story. The story of Desiree Sunford is a classic tale of never judge a book by its cover. Connie, tell me about Desiree. What kind of person was she? She was just fun. <laughs> By day, Desiree was a much adored but nerdy art teacher. The kids loved her. Always happy, always moving. But by night, she was a born-to-be wild, Harley-riding motorcycle mama. She sounds adventurous. She learned how to ride and bought herself a Harley Davidson and hit the road. <laughs> and always by Desiree's side, her husband Scott, an ex-army mechanic, who served two tours in Iraq. When did she first meet Scott? Um, actually, they were high school sweethearts. For nearly two decades, the young couple was practically inseparable. What'd you make of Scott? I never really warmed up to him totally. Did you guys butt heads? Um, occasionally, he would say or do something that got my dander up. And there was one thing that really brought out the mama bear in Connie. She was concerned, I think, about his fidelity, but there was never anything that we could prove or substantiate that, that he was being unfaithful. Despite Desiree's suspicion, she stands by her man. The couple even buys their first home together, just outside the city limits in Yakima, Washington. She was excited about the new house, and life was just good. But just six months after moving in, there's trouble in paradise. So there was a burglary at Scott and Desiree's residence. Detective Chad Michael with the Yakima County Sheriff's Office says the burglar smashes through a pane of glass in the back door and ransacks the house. Firearms, computers. Scott temporarily patches the broken glass and steps up security. They had a security system installed. To give them a chance to get used to the new system, the security company only sends alerts to Scott and Desiree. The cops are not notified. So if the alarm's tripped, um, it, it goes to the homeowner uh, cell phone connection. A few days after the alarm is installed, Scott heads out of town for his aunt's funeral. It's about an hour outside of Yakima. At 324 that morning, Scott gets an unexpected wake-up call. Scott did get an alarm notification someone was entering his house. Just three minutes later at 327, he gets a second alarm. Then one minute later at 328, a third notification lights up his phone. Scott assumes Desiree accidentally tripped the alarm, letting their dog out, and he goes back to sleep. He doesn't call the sheriff's office. He did not, no. Later that afternoon, Scott heads home. On the way back to Yakima, he finally checks in on Desiree. You've reached Desiree Sunford and leave me a message. After a few unanswered calls, Scott starts to worry those tripped alarms in the middle of the night were no accident, and he calls 911. Sheriff's office. Hi, ma'am. Um, this is Scott Sunford. Today at 324, 327, and 328, I had three fences tripped. 
Okay, did somebody break into the residence? I don't know. I've been out of town and I haven't been able to get a hold of the wife. He was concerned about her uh, and he wanted the uh, sheriff's office to send someone out to check his house. A wellness check. A wellness check. Scott Sumford, is he driving to the house? He has not arrived at the house yet. As soon as I have somebody available, I will send them out to your address, okay? Okay, thank you. 20 minutes later, Scott Sunford pulls in his driveway. The cops aren't there yet, but as he drives in, panic strikes. Scott makes a second, more desperate 911 call. I just got home and the board that I have over my back door has been broken, so somebody has forced their way in again, and I still haven't heard back from my wife. I need an officer here now. All right, we'll get someone out there. I'm not going to go in or touch anything, but I'm here, I'm in the car, and I got a spotlight on the door. Wait a minute, his wife could be in danger, and this ex-military man tells cops he's not going in? It just strikes me as bizarre that he would get to the house and then wait for a deputy to accompany him inside? Certainly, yeah, yeah. And if I, you know, Scott's a big guy, he's, I've seen him, he's, uh, you know, what, 6'5", maybe 200 and... 230, 240, military trained. He's, he's got his sidearm on him and he waited outside of his house for uh, law enforcement to arrive to, to search the house. Within minutes, a Yakima County deputy arrives wearing a body camera. Scott, who's packing a pistol, is still inexplicably waiting in the driveway. If you thought something was wrong, why didn't you go in? The deputy wearing the body cam spots that broken door, then cautiously enters the home in case the burglar has come back and is still lurking inside. With his gun drawn, he peers around each corner until he finally finds a light switch. And when he flips it on... My whole world just came to a sudden stop. And life as I knew it would never be the same again. My doorbell rang. And I opened the door to two Grant County Sheriff deputies. And they informed me that my daughter's body had been found. She had been shot to death, murdered in her home. It appears the 30-year-old art teacher tried to crawl away, but couldn't escape a fatal 9 millimeter bullet to her head. Did... Desiree have any enemies that you knew of? No. No, not at all. She was a friend to everyone. So it boggled my mind to, to think of that, you know, who could have possibly had that much aggression against her to kill her? Initially, Desiree's husband, Scott Sunford, tells investigators he suspects a burglar who had hit their house just a week before had returned. And this time, he takes Desiree's life when she caught him in the act. Did you buy that story or theory? Not really. Neither did the Yakima County Sheriff's Office, so detectives haul Scott in for questioning. But while Scott waits in the interrogation room, deputies notice something odd. Instead of mourning Desiree's horrific death, Scott appears to be psyching himself up for the questions to come. Was he torn up at all, emotional, that his wife was just found shot to death? It doesn't seem like his emotions were on par with um, the situation. Investigators begin with the burning question on everyone's mind. It sounds like by the time you actually made it to the house, you were pretty frantic. Like, you felt like something had gone wrong. My stomach was churning, I was shaking. I, I had convinced myself by that point something had to be wrong. So why not go in the house and check things out and make sure she's okay? Because <sighs> I was afraid. Afraid? The tough pistol packing military guy? Scared? You're shaking your head. That's, that's exactly what anyone and everyone that hears that part of the story is totally dumbfounded. It's just not normal husbandly behavior. Yeah, even if you're afraid that the bad guy is still in there, this is your wife. Yeah. You're gonna leave her in there to fend for herself with the bad guy? 
Desiree's mother, Connie Cast, and Yakima detectives begin to wonder if Scott didn't enter the house because he already knew what he was going to find. Well, it's not that I was afraid of anybody being in there. You just don't want to see what may have happened to her. Yeah. Does he go to the top of the list as a potential suspect? He does. He was considered uh, a suspect in this case. But Scott maintains he's completely innocent. He even offers up an ironclad alibi. He was an hour outside of Yakima for a family funeral. Then you stayed at your dad's in Kennewick? Uh, no, I actually stayed with a friend. A female friend. Was it uh, just a platonic friendship? Or were you, did you have well, a sexual relationship? No, and honestly, we didn't even do anything. I was out on the couch. Here's where Scott's alibi gets complicated. The woman in the blonde wig is Scott's alibi, and they've got a secret. He came in and spent the night at my place. Scott says he slept on the couch, is that true? No, no it's not. If he was in my house, he was in my bed. She's sitting down with Crime Watch Daily for her first interview ever. You wanted to conceal your identity and not use your name, and we're not using your name. We're respecting your wishes, we help disguise and alter your identity. Right. She says she's finally ready to come clean about what happened in the days and months leading up to Desiree's horrific murder. When you met Scott, did you know he was married to Desiree? Um, I knew that he was married, but I had been told that he was separated. At what point did you and Scott start to get intimate? Uh, actually, it was the day that I found out that he was still actively married. And you're what, the mistress? I didn't see myself being a mistress long term. I also wasn't entirely sure that I wanted to date him, but sex was cool. So I, I went with that. The mistress tells me shortly after the affair started, Scott concocted an elaborate plan to introduce her to Desiree, telling his wife she was dating his buddy. Why'd you and Scott want to arrange this meeting? We didn't want her to be suspicious. Did you guys hit it off? Oh, yeah. Yeah, from the very beginning, actually, we uh, we became very, very close. I helped her plan Scott's 30th birthday the following month. While you're still sleeping with Scott? Yes. And does she have any idea? Not at the time, no. The mistress says she and Desiree got a little too close for comfort. I was living with them part-time. We all slept in the same bed. How big is this bed? It's a California king. You know, we all, we all shared the same bed. And at the time, it was Desi in the middle and eventually it moved to Scott being in the middle. Is it possible Scott wanted to kick Desiree out of the bed for good, and the mistress was motive for murder? Scott's wife is dead. Sure. Scott's, mm -hmm. Scott's not with her when she's gunned down, but you find out now that he, he has an affair. Uh -huh. So if you're looking at motivation. Sure, yeah, there's, there's red flags that pop up. But when the detective drills Scott about the affair, he tells him he's got it all wrong. You know, I shouldn't go there because it's kind of rude, but, uh, well, Des didn't want me to say anything to anybody, but at one point, her and had a, a little thing going for a while there. So it was, so, it was Desiree and you had the sexual relationship? Yeah, sometimes, we all did. Sometimes you're too. Honestly, we all did. You're sleeping with Desiree's husband unbeknownst to her at the time. Yes. But then you start sleeping with Desiree. And at that point it was, well, let's just do it all together. It, uh, it evolved into a polyamorous relationship. So to be clear, all of you are having a consensual open relationship. Yes. All of you are having sex with each other. Yes. And how long did this threesome last? Up until right before she was murdered, actually. The mistress tells me she and Scott never wanted to get rid of Desiree. They both loved her. But after the murder, you're still seeing Scott. Yeah, yeah. And what's going through your mind? I was under the thinking of Scott and his mistress had something to do with it. Quite the coincidence. Yeah, perfect alibi. They were together, so he he said she didn't do it because she was with me. She said he didn't do it because he was with me. The mistress is now making the claim that her, Scott, and Desiree, your daughter, were in a polyamorous relationship. I can safely say that my daughter would never have participated in 
such an act. No threesomes going on. Absolutely not. Detectives also find the alibi shaky, but there's no proof Scott or his mistress had anything to do with Desiree's murder. In fact, investigators actually discover mystery DNA in a bloody shoe print at the crime scene that doesn't belong to either one of them. It's one of those cases where you just start scratching your head trying to figure out what is, what is going on here. And after months of hitting dead ends, the case goes cold. There wasn't anybody else to look at. Then, a year and a half after Desiree Sunford was gunned down inside her home, a tip is called in to Crime Stoppers saying they know who murdered the young teacher. Who was this tipster? The tipster in the situation was uh, was the mistress. Was uh, Scott's, Scott's mistress? mistress? Yes, Scott's mistress. When Desiree Sunford was found shot to death, cops and almost everyone close to the case suspects it's her husband, Scott, who pulled the trigger. Until his mistress steps forward, giving him an airtight alibi. I knew that he had been with me all night. I knew that there was no way that he could have done it. The mistress tells me in this Crime Watch Daily exclusive, there was no reason for Scott to kill Desiree, claiming she was well aware of the affair. In fact, she says Desiree was a willing part of a happy love triangle. You're having sex with Desiree. I'm having sex with Desiree's Scott. Desiree's having sex with her husband. Mm -hmm. You're having sex with Scott. Yeah. Everyone's on the same page. Exactly. But was there a motive about to be delivered? You find out you're pregnant with Scott's kid. Yeah. The happy threesome was about to become an incredibly awkward family of four. Because he didn't want Desiree to find out. He never said that, but probably. Very probably. Still, cops don't have proof. And remember, there is mystery DNA and a bloody shoe print found at the crime scene that doesn't belong to Scott. A year and a half goes by, then a call comes into the Crime Stoppers tip line. It's the mistress telling cops someone has confessed to murder. I put it into the, the Crime Watchers tip line. They were like, this is information that we never release to the public and the detectives would like to talk to you. We made sure that everything was wiped out and completely clean, no fingerprints on anything, none of the bullets, reloaded the clip. <sighs> Turn his phone off before he left the house. We blurred the mistress's face to keep her true identity hidden. But what she tells police is crystal clear. He asked me if I wanted him to take care of this new woman like he did Des. The mistress isn't talking about her lover, Desiree's husband, Scott. She says the killer is a man named Marty Grismer, who just happens to be the mistress's best friend. Tell me about Marty Grismer. What do you want to know? How'd you meet him? At work, actually. At one point, I went out on a date with Marty and that was a really bad idea. Did you and Marty ever have sex? No, no. He tried really hard and it wasn't happening. Would you say Marty was infatuated with you? No, Marty was obsessed with me. He would always tell me how perfect I was and how much he loved me and adored me and cherished me and would do anything for me. Anything, including murder. He said, well, I'm the one who killed Desiree. Didn't you know that? No, actually I didn't. What did Marty tell you? He reenacted what he had done and how he had made it look like a break-in. He told me eventually everything. Apparently, he decided that if the baby was Scott's, then Desiree would cause issues. Oh my God. The mistress told detectives she and Marty actually talked about the best way to kill people, but she thought it was all a joke. You and Marty, they say, have this hobby, you just said, debating how best to kill someone, dispose the body, and get away with murder. How to build the perfect crime. You know normal people don't talk about I, I planning do know death, that. right? A normal hobby is fishing, hot yoga, origami, not planning out murder. That's true. That's very true, but those were never my hobbies. Why did Marty tell you he murdered Desiree? 
All he would tell me was to make you happy. And I said, well, why did you think that that would make me happy? And he says, because now you're going to have this baby. I wanted you and Scott to be able to start a fresh life. Detectives asked the mistress to wear a wire. They want to get Grismer's confession on tape. You said that there was no evidence. So I'm just wondering for sure, for sure, if there's nothing left. I don't know what you're talking about. Hmm. But it backfires. Grismer denies everything. Then the mistress tells cops she's got another ace up her sleeve, claiming she knows where Grismer stashed the things he took from the crime scene. And better yet, where he hid his gun. He had a gun barrel in his drawer at work. That gun barrel was found after forensics examination to have been used in the homicide. Detectives haul Grismer in for questioning. That's just a simple yes or no question. Did you kill her? But no, I did not. She's saying that, no, you did this. You did that. You drove the rim cardiac. It was your gun. And guess what? The barrel of that gun is in your possession. I've never killed anyone. Well, he denies it. Yeah. Grismer adamantly denies having anything to do with Desiree's murder, claiming he's been framed by a woman he worshipped and adored. She's trying to engineer, set me up here, do something I'm saying to you that, um, that killed someone, other that... I think it makes me sick. Suddenly, Marty makes his own shocking allegation, telling detectives it's the mistress who had Desiree murdered. What I know is that I was enraged. That's all I know. He's saying she's the one who's involved. Trying to punt the responsibility onto her. Grismer tells detectives he loaned the mistress's gun months earlier, and now he believes she's planted evidence to set him up. It's my word against her is on all of it on there. What's going through my head is that I'm screwed for life here and I've done nothing. Grismer is right, but it's not only the mistress's sworn statement that buries him. Remember that bloody shoe print? It turns out it's the same size and brand of shoe Grismer wears. Prosecutors charge Marty Grismer with murder in the first degree. You were confident then that you had your guy? Detectives were very confident that, uh, that they had the right guy. But Desiree's mother, Connie Cast, isn't so confident Grismer acted alone. I can believe that he did the deed by himself, but how did he know that Desiree was going to be alone that night? It's a good question. My theory was that Scott and his mistress gave Marty the information that she was going to be alone. And Connie says that's not the only thing that makes her believe there was a conspiracy to have her daughter murdered. Remember the baby the mistress was carrying when Desiree was killed? Turns out Scott wasn't the daddy. Scott's mistress was pregnant with some other guy's child. But said that it was Scott's. Said it was Scott's. Connie believes the mistress knowingly lied about Scott being the father and about her relationship with Desiree. So we started to dig deeper into the mistress's story and uncovered explosive text messages that may blow the case wide open. Desiree writes to you, quote, your guy's comfort level with each other is much higher than I'm okay with. This is you writing to her. I'm sure I could have sex with him. I just don't think about it because he's married. So cut the crap with me now. You are not in an open relationship with Scott and Desiree. The woman in the blonde wig is the key player in the messy murder mystery surrounding school teacher Desiree Sunford. If you weren't sleeping with Desiree's husband, would she still be alive today? I don't know. The mistress says she didn't kill Desiree and neither did Desiree's husband, Scott. She points the finger at her best friend, Marty Grismer, as the killer and claims he actually confessed to her. Why did Marty tell you he murdered Desiree? He wanted me to be happy. That was always his end goal, was my happiness. Here's the problem. We've uncovered some glaring inconsistencies in her story. We'll start from the beginning. Were you in an open relationship with Desiree and Scott? Yes. 
Desiree was approving you're having sex with Scott. Yes. And you were having sex with Desiree. Mm hmm And that's your final answer. Yes. You're lying to us right now. You're a liar. I'm not lying. If she's not lying, how does she explain these text messages we found? Desiree sure doesn't sound like she's condoning any hanky-panky or any kinky threesome. Desiree writes, I'm just getting frustrated. You two chat and show pics and I tend to get left out. One of you leaves, the other hops out too. It's adding up and over time, it's starting to bug me. You're right, I try to stay out of the way as much as possible. I understand if you don't want me here. Desiree said, there's something wrong here. See, Desiree is onto something. She's saying, there's, there's, something, there's something not right about this relationship you have with my husband. So you can cut the act that she was approving of anything you were doing. In fact, she's suspicious here that you're having an affair. I don't remember that conversation. Oh, you don't remember? Well, let me remind you of another one. This is you writing to her. If you ever die and he needs a wife, I'm half convinced that would be me. Just, it's coincidence a year later. Was that Desiree does end up dead. You were not in an open relationship with Scott and Desiree? We were. No, you, I'm just reading text messages to you that suggest blatantly the exact opposite. The mistress also claims Marty Grismer was just an annoying friend who had a sexual obsession with her, an almost fatal attraction. While we're on the subject of uh, your honesty, you said uh, Marty was obsessed with you, but you never had any type of sexual relationship with Marty. Right. What about the nude photo exchanges between you two? Yeah, there were definitely nude photo exchanges. Between you two? Yes. Did you wonder why Marty may have been obsessed if you're sending him new photos? But that's not having sex. That's a sexual relationship if you're sending new photos. You know, here's my private parts, but it's not sexual. Yeah, but I send them to a lot of people. His new job. Most of the photos that Marty got, Scott also got. So did Scott's dad. You were close with Scott Sr. as well? Yeah. Did you and Scott Sr. fool around? Yeah. Yeah, we fooled around but we never had sex. Despite all of her inconsistencies and the suspicious behavior of Desiree's husband, Scott, cops say the evidence still points to Grismer as the lone killer, and prosecutors charge him with first-degree murder. But in an odd courtroom twist, Grismer takes what's called an Alfred plea. Which essentially says that the state has a good case and it could uh, find him guilty if he, if he fights it. But Grismer maintains his innocence with this plea. Mm -hmm. uh, ever run through your mind that maybe the mistress and Scott set him up and used Marty as a patsy? There will always be questions, I suppose. As far as this investigation goes, is the case closed? Case is closed. Yeah, we're done. We've moved on. What was running through your mind when he took that deal? My heart hit the floor. I was extremely angry. I cried a lot. I didn't feel like justice had been done. There was a lot of anger. <laughs> Sorry. I still get mad about it. You can stop the tears. You know, I don't buy a word you're saying. My story has been the same from the beginning. Grismer is sentenced to 15 years behind bars, but there is an interesting catch. As part of the Alfred plea deal, Grismer does have one year to change his mind and fight the murder charge in court. What do you make of the sentence? Justice was not served by, by that sentence. Does it bother you that, yeah, you have one guy who's serving 15 years in prison for gunning down your daughter, but other people may have gotten away scot-free? Oh, it, it drives me bonkers. Every time I think of Scott running around, happy-go-lucky, it just infuriates me. Whether or not he planned it, he is the reason my daughter is dead. Bottom line, his actions directly caused her death. Connie, you know what's just crazy? I'm getting an email from my producer who has notified me that while we've been talking right now, Marty 
reached out to him to say that he's innocent, that he had nothing to do with your daughter's murder. The email goes on to say, in part, I was naive and trusting. I did nothing to Miss Sunford. I had nothing to gain. Do you have a message for anyone else who may have been involved, not yet charged, certainly not yet convicted, who may be involved in your daughter's death? Karma's a when she's got your number. You never know when she's gonna come get you. The mistress and Scott are no longer together after finding out the baby wasn't Scott's. The father was one of the mistress's ex-boyfriends. Do you feel any guilt? Only when I feel like if I had just cut Marty out a lot sooner, it never would have happened. How do you think you did in this interview? I didn't cry too much. But we know the tears were fake. They so. weren't though. People are gonna watch this and say, man, this woman is lying up and down. I'm not lying. 